Will China take down the global economy? Are there signs that workers are tapped out? Will consumers reject inflation? And why did we have one of the best 10-year treasury auctions in history this week? Answers to those questions and more on today's show. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and I have missed all of you. I know some of you have been emailing and messaging. Where did you go? What happened? Well, as you can see by the background, I was at the BlockWorks realignment event in Brenton Woods, New Hampshire, uh, hosted by my buddy, Mike Ippolito, and it was great. I mean, was, there were all kinds of big name stars there. We had Jeff Booth, Lynn Alden, Luke Roman, Daniel DiMartino Booth, Brent Johnson, and Mike Green, just to name a few. And those were the macro people. There's a whole group of, of crypto people. I don't even know them because as many of you know, I'm, I'm not well versed in the crypto space. Anyways, we had a great time and talked, of course, a lot about macroeconomics and the you know, future of the monetary system. And while I was there, I had planned to record my shows. There was a problem. My primary mic failed, and my secondary mic failed. So with that, we're back here on the weekend. And just as we mentioned earlier, you'll notice that this show will no longer have a name. If you're curious why, I'm sure someone in the comments will talk about it, or you can follow the story on my Twitter feed, at Meter Steven. All right, but let's get into what's going on with China because there's serious implications for the global economy. Now, what's happening in China is their credit growth is slowing. And in a debt-based economy, it's very important that when you, your credit growth grows, your economy grows. And when it starts to shrink, or even worse, contract, well, that means your economy is going to contract. And for China, one of the problems is they pump their credit. You know, the government comes in and just forces lending and just makes these banks go out and, and expand their books. And then they get inflation and then they get bubbles and they try to pull it back. Well, it's pretty difficult. Japan found out how that worked when they tried to do something similar. And what we see is this trend, and I want to look at some articles and some charts, that when China does this, starts to pull down the whole rest of the world. Uh, let's go to this piece on Zero Head. The China credit growth unexpectedly collapses. And one month ago, they observed that after tumbling for much of 2020 and even turning negative in early quarter two, so negative being really bad, China's credit impulse had finally trialed with significant consequences for global reflation. So you, what I want you to understand here is that China being the world's largest producer, exporter, yeah, when when they see they export inflation, so if they're seeing their credit growth decline or even worse contract, well that means they're going to export deflation and hence destroy the kind of the notion of this reflationary bubble. So that's what I want you to be thinking about here. And but with China's uh, economy rapidly slowing and Beijing considering what is the best way to stimulate the economy without leading to another overheating constant problem with China, the latest Chinese credit data overnight was missed every consensus expectation confirming that Beijing's latest attempt to reflate the local and global economy will not be a walk in the park. So it's not working as we dig into this. What we can see is they're having lots of trouble getting this credit growth to move out. And how do we see this? After strong points in June, new RMB loans, total social financing, and M2 all surprised the downside in July, not what they want, as both corporate and household loans slowed, while government bond net issuance was also small in July versus June, June due to the large amount of maturing bonds this month. Meanwhile, the shadow banking credit continues to correct. So tight regulations likely continue to slow credit extensions to proper to property consumers and LGFV sectors and credit demand in the rest of the economy has also been weak as interest rates decline along with a slowdown in credit growth in July. So you know, what you're seeing in this in article is the notion that this reflationary trade is ending and that since the U.S. is the end of the supply chain, well, that we're more likely to see a disinflationary trend. Of course, we're going to talk about the CPI here pretty soon. And so needless to say, this is not an acceptable outcome to Beijing. And as a result, Goldman concludes that the weak credit data and the recent resurgence of virus, along with strict controls, increased the likelihood of incremental policy easing. So Goldman's suggesting that, hey, they're going to come out, you know, maybe not something like quantitative easing, but they're going to need to ease the their credit conditions the given that the latest data was ugly and will hammer china's credit impulse pushing to the lowest level in over two years however 
is that very downshift in Chinese credit flows that ensures Beijing will have no choice but to aggressively ease in the coming months and push China's hibernating credit growth back into overdrive and, of course, risk another bubble. And, of course, we can go to uh, my friend uh, Alfonso, who has the uh, a newsletter, the Macro Compass. You might have, if you're a, a subscriber to Real Vision, you probably have seen the interview of Phenomenal. He's wonderful. You can find him on Twitter at Macro Alf. And again, if you want to get signed up for his newsletter, all you have to do is uh, type in, or I think the website is the Macro Compass, but go look for it. And what he's showing here, and we talked about this in his Real Vision interview, is the Chinese credit impulse as a percentage of GDP has been declining now for a while. And what this means is that you see yields in China, their version of treasury yield, lag this and will fall. Now, what we don't have here is a chart that shows that when China, when the yields on Chinese bond, government bonds go down, well, guess what also goes down? And that's right, it tends to also put downward pressure on treasury yields. And here we can see the 30-year treasury yield coming down. We'll talk about probably this more on the Sunday chart show, but you see it got driven up and then a hard rejection there on Friday. So as yields in China go lower, well, U.S. Treasury yields will also follow. But the implications of, of what's going on with China's credit impulse get worse. Again, as Alfonso shows in this chart, that the Russell 2000 started underperforming the NASDAQ as anticipated by the credit impulse. So here you see G5 credit impulse, and you see Russell versus NASDAQ with a 10-month lag. He'll tell you this. You should not use this as a timing tool, but it's telling you the likely direction of where equity markets are going or at least it starts to give you some probabilities of that because of this big move down in credit impulse all right let's get into data because there's some great stuff in here that i want to take a look at uh first one is non-farm productivity now th this one isn't going to give you a lot of answers to kind of but the next one will which is unit labor cost so i want to set up productivity for you so let's say that you had an infinitely long, perfectly straight road and you took your car out there, motorcycle, whatever it is to drive, truck even, and you put it out there and you put the pedal to the metal and your vehicle accelerates, but there's a point where it runs out of steam. And that's true in the labor force. There's only so much productivity you can get out of your workers before they run out of steam. And then of course, you know, you need to eventually bring in more technology so they can be more efficient. So the first thing we're gonna do is look at what happens when the labor market runs out of steam. And then we're gonna look at unit labor costs, which gets factored into, you know, can you guess what the biggest part of unit labor costs is? Wages. And there's some really, really interesting there. So let's take a look at that. So what we're seeing, and we have productivity data, but going back into the late 1940s, and in more modern times, what you tend to see is productivity rises because, you know, in, in when the economy is growing strong, workers get more done. They make more money per, per worker. And then all of a sudden it, says it starts to peak and roll over and then it fights, it, but it still has a downtrend. And then in, they potentially get another recession and then it comes out of the recession and workers are become very efficient and it finally gets back down to normal. And then you see it trending up. So it starts to look like someone similar to this post 90 or post yeah night late 90s early 2000 boom where workers are now running out of steam and we're starting to see some moves lower in that and that tends to tell you a recession is potentially right around the corner you see that here in the 90s you see that here and you can even see there was a bit of a lag going in the great financial crisis but it eventually triggered one now we hear all this talk about wages going up and this is interesting because unit labor costs for the second quarter, flat. I mean, if wages were going up, then that means other things were going down to give you an overall picture that unit labor costs were not moving. But what's interesting about labor costs is you've, if you think about this from being, you know, from a productivity standpoint, is the more a worker is doing, more output they can generate, what do they want for it? You know, they want to be compensated for it. They know they're doing a lot of work that it took maybe two, three, or more people to do want to be paid for it but this is kind of something that's interesting we'll see it from a recessionary standpoint when unit labor costs start to head down in a cycle especially here more modern times and definitely now as you move into qe era when unit labor costs go down and it did even here in 2014 where there was a major slowdown 
in the economy in 15 and 16. It shouldn't say major in terms of recession, but it was you know, got close to that. And now what are we seeing uh, with unit labor costs effectively unchanged in the second quarter on a year over year basis, telling us that perhaps we are near the end of this cycle that everyone thinks is never going to stop. Now, let's take a look at consumer prices, because the question I want to answer here is there evidence that we can look to to see if consumers can afford these higher prices because the, the overall belief is the higher prices beget higher prices and that they're just going to rise and now it's uncontrollable and, and it's not going to stop and everyone's going to keep doing it and i keep making the point is you cannot have higher prices on a sustained basis if people can't afford them but that doesn't always get well received when i say it but maybe if we look at it from a chart standpoint, it'll make more sense. So let's take a look at the CPI and start out. What happened here? Well, it was unchanged. Uh, I think it came, I think it was prior month was five, yeah, five three on a year over year basis, five three on a year over year basis for July. So when do we start seeing the, the CPI do that? Well, we tend to see it at peaks when it starts to slow down. So there's some evidence that this would be a potential peak for me. Obviously, we won't know uh, until for a couple more months. But when we take that and say, well, how do we know? I mean, is there is there a way we could, I don't want to say predict, but maybe increase the probabilities that we know which direction the CBI is going to go? Because many people, again, believe that it just goes up from here forward. But what if there's more mounting evidence that it could go lower. Well, I want to look at the velocity of money. And what that all that does is it tabulates essentially how many times money either moves between hands or is used in a transaction over a period of time. So if you look at inflation, how, how there's a couple ways you could get it. You could print a lot of money, you turn on the, you know, the, the money printer goes burr, and you put a lot of money out in the economy, which people think is QE's doing, but it's not, it just creates bank reserves. Or you can have money exchanging hands rapidly, or you have both together, and then you have real lots of inflation. So you can get inflation mainly in one of two ways, print money, which the Fed can't, or it circulates and moves through the system quickly. So the velocity of money tells us how quickly it's moving through the system. Let's take a look at this chart. And I'm mostly interested in the post QE world, and you can pull this chart up on the Fred database and go back and see that it, it's. There's, I'm, I'm not cutting it short because it's hiding anything, but you, we can look here in the 2000s. You can see that velocity of money was relatively stable at around three and a half percent year over year, and that led to an increase in inflation. And then as that started to slow because it wasn't sustainable then all of a sudden you see that last peak of inflation going into the financial crisis and then all of a sudden velocity trends down and the cpi heads lower and then we follow after that we do see a big rise in the cpi but notice the, the trend of volatility going lower why would that happen well because quantitative easing as we've talked about before traps dollars in the financial system in what we call a dollar prison and that is designed to strengthen the dollar and slow how many times dollars are used in transactions and so even though there were bursts of inflation you can see the general trend of slowing volatility brought inflation lower and then we get into you know after come out of 20 into the late 2016 early 2017 and velocity starts to stabilize and that means inflation can kind of rise and we see that here but then what happens velocity crashes and it does that kind of before we go into the pandemic why because the Fed restarted QE, remember that, they did restart QE, slows velocity down, and then coming out of this, many inflation experts said, look, the economy's reopening velocity is gonna go way up, and didn't, remember we looked at this, went flat, and that's telling you that this inflation, while we know a lot of it is supply chain issues, and due to the, the global economy shutting down, it tells us the likely path. Because remember, you know, here it shot up in, two, in the great financial crisis, and then it came crashing down. And look, it, it, it didn't go down much. It's, it's gone down and stayed down. And due to the Fed continuing to pump QE, the likely direction for the velocity of money is lower, which would suggest that probabilities weigh that the CPI is going to roll over and head lower. Now, the one thing the Fed does love is to strip out food and energy from the CPI because we know that food and energy costs are volatile. And if you're trying to run monetary policy, you want to use the smallest number as possible. So you need to cut out the things that go up the most. 
And even then, you still get this rapidly ascending uh, core CPI at 4.5% year over year. And then it's showing a potential peak now that it may be it has had enough at 4.2. Keep in mind that about 80% of the core CBI had a year over year uh, at 1%. It was only 20% of this index that was driving up inflation. So likely to see that change. So the real question now is, so we know prices have gone up. Not much of a surprise. We all can go to the stores and we can see that. The question that should be asked is can consumers afford those higher prices? Because if they can, if their wages are growing fast enough, then they can afford those higher prices. Because you know, what does economic growth really come down to? Discretionary spending. Where do you get inflation from? Discretionary spending. We need to see that growing. So you need to see wages growing. If you're not seeing wages growing, then what that means is they can't afford the higher prices. And if they can't afford it, they consume less. Consume less, prices must go down to compensate. So what we're going to focus on in the economic data is something called real wages now let's go back and i've kind of been remiss of going through the the data here but let's go take a look we'll catch up to uh, where we need to be mortgage applications were up 2.8 percent but here's the key you know real earnings month over month were down 0.1 percent now the month before they were revised higher from minus 0.9 to minus 0.5 now what does it mean if you may remember when you hear real you hear inflation adjusted earnings. So what this means is after inflation, workers had less money to spend. So prices are rising faster than their wages. And that is a huge problem. So how do we kind of express that? Well, I looked up the average hourly earnings of all employees and I could have, I suppose I could subtract the two and try to do a year over year chart. But I thought it might be easier just to see the consumer price index overlaid and not the core because we want to use all prices and we certainly know food and energy are big factors but look at 2008 you see consumer prices were rising and wages on a year-over-year -year rate were not rising as much and so what what happened then is consumers couldn't afford those higher prices prices had to come down wages kind of perked up a little bit but then they went down too and it would make sense because why would wages fall people were losing their jobs. So inflation bottoms out, you start to see wages bottom out. And now that gives the opportunity for prices to rise again. But look what happens again, prices start going up too fast, wage growth is static, and prices have to come back down. Again, the, the, the rate of growth of those prices comes down. And it tries to keep driving prices ahead of wages until boom it can no longer and what you'll notice is that when the cpi goes ahead or grows faster than when wait when it grows faster than wages it can sustain for a while particularly during periods of credit growth because people can borrow and stay ahead of the curve but when the economy slides to slow and wages aren't there to back those higher prices well we know prices have to come down and so what are we seeing now in blue you're seeing total hourly earnings which are more likely to roll over and head back down as we start to lose uh, some of uh, the last of the government assistance and what does that tell you prices up here cannot be afforded by consumers they will get rejected at least the probabilities say that how about we go into the last of the data for wednesday and then we'll do we'll catch up on to some of this stuff oh yeah we got the cleveland cpi forgot to pull this chart up uh, let's see if we can get the Cleveland CPI pulled up here because this yes here it is that's what I want is it's at 0.3 percent month over month as you may have just seen here uh, went up where did it go 0.3 and it's not super hot it's on we'll just say it's on the hotter side of you know normal uh, but when we look into the details here the you know, base CPI was up 0.5 and the median CPI, according to Cleveland flood, was up 0.3. And we look at the year over year comps and we see the CPI at 5.4, the median CPI 2.3. And is that 2.3 a big deal? No, it's actually kind of on the lower side of where it's been since 2012. Now it is trending up, but you'll notice that we're not seeing broad based inflation at all. How about we look at, take a quick look at crude oil inventories because then I want to talk about that 10 year auction. Uh, crude oil inventories 
uh, uh, were down slightly, but w were remain well below their, their historical averages for this time of the year. Distilled stocks went up, but again, they're still kind of you know below their average of where they should be, and that's good. And gasoline inventories are down. They're below where their averages are, so nothing bad in this report here at all. Now let's talk about the 10-year Treasury auction because this is going to surprise a lot of people, and it did, and even though yields went up, they that day they did get reversed following the auction because no one saw this coming i wish i could say i did i'm gonna tell you why this happened or at least why i think it happened let's take a look at this one what do we have here uh fantastic demand check this out uh indirect bidders took about 77 percent of this auction at all, a little, little 31 point uh six billion dollars leaving dealers with just under four billion and remember the Fed is buying, I want to say, I have to, I should double check, I think around $6.8 billion of 10 year treasuries a month. So now the dealers didn't even get enough supply this month to, to, for the Fed. That means the dealers will have to go out in the open market and source these. What direction will that put yields? Put downward pressure on yields. Bid to cover was just off the normal charts, at two, uh, well above the six month average of 2.65. So the question is, why? Did this happen? And perhaps that is, I haven't worn the crown in a little while, so we'll put the crown on and have this discussion. Is remember, the Fed opened a standing repo facility. We've talked about this recently, where you can buy any treasury security or agency backed security. And if you need cash, you can go to the Fed and for a quarter percent on an annualized basis, you borrow money on an overnight. And you can keep cycling that, so that's not a big deal. But what it does is it makes intermediate and longer term treasury securities liquid, meaning that there's no need to go to the market. If you need cash, you can go to the Fed. And if you buy something such as a 10 year, uh, let's see where the, the high yield was at 1.340. So if your borrowing cost is at 0.25, well, you can cash flow just under 1.1% if you need money. And what is that 1.1% better than? Yeah, the, the overnight repo, reverse repo at 0.05%. So what the Fed is doing is they're incentivizing people to buy intermediate and long-term notes and bonds and use the standing repo facilities instead of selling them on the market when they need cash. What that's doing is creating demand for the intermediate and long end of the curve. Why they're doing that? Well, we'll save that story for another day. With that, we'll wrap up. Again, thanks for being fans. Thanks for checking in on me. I wish I could have been there with you last week. Again, I had all my equipment, but something just didn't go right. So it wasn't meant to be, but we're back bigger and better than ever. And I love all of you. And I'll see you tomorrow on the Sunday Night Charge Show. And of course, we'll be back. We got more catch up to do on the Monday show. I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. Bye now. The content of this video is provided as educational information only. It's not intended to provide investment or advice. Shields not to be construed as a recognition or solicitation by our security, financial instrument, or participate in a particular training strategy. This video was prepared by Steam Van Meter on personal capacity. Business expressed in this video that I do not reflect the view of Atlas Financial Advising or Steam Van Meter Financial.